what kind of brand are you trying to, to be? What are you, what, are, what is your brand, right? Who are, who is your, your audience? Who do you want your audience to be, right? What is the meaning behind your, like just figuring out what they really want and then mm -hmm. cleaning up their Instagram completely to make it pleasing and aesthetically pleasing, right? You know how I know how much you love that, but just, just making it make sense, right? So if you're obviously, if you're a fitness person, you're not gonna, you're not, you don't need to post makeup because that's just confusing everybody, right? If you want to start a little like highlight and put stories there to, to make your page clean and like have categories and if somebody is interested in this, they can click here. That's, I like organization and I like to speak on that. Uh, what time to post, right? Let's break down your analytics. First of all, a lot of these, a lot of these influencers don't even have their analytics set up because they don't have a business account. So it's just like the baby things in the beginning that a lot of people don't realize that it's huge, it's made. You cannot be an influencer without it, right? The right. business page, the um, how to, how to, when to post, how to really, really study your analytics to try to like beat the algorithm and collaborations, collaborations with photographers, different influencers. Then we go into um, connecting them with my personal relationships, helping them shoot with the right people, introducing them to influencers in the same space, kind of building a community of people that can work together, um, similar to uh, like uh, engagement groups, right? Okay. So yeah. kind of yeah. like, right. And then we go, it's just, we're breaking it down. You gotta, you gotta sign up. You're listening to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, the only podcast that helps you turn pro in mind, body, spirit, and business. What is up, Wake Up Wealthy listeners? It's your host, Brody Kern, and welcome to the podcast where we show you how to max out in mind, body, spirit, and business. Today we have on a very special guest, Natalia Castellon. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Thanks for having me on. Um, I also go, I also am known by Nat City on Instagram, but I haven't actually heard anybody introduce me with Natalia Castellon in a long time, and you said that correctly, so I'm proud of you. AKA Nat City. That's what I should have said, apparently. All right. No, well, you said it correctly. You said my name right. Like, no one ever says it correctly. So, so I, I mean, I didn't say it perfect, though. Like, I don't have any sort of accent there. I have tried, like, learning Spanish a couple times, and, uh, like, I can't, cannot, like, get any, I sound so, uh, like, white and American whenever I try to, like, roll my R's or, you know, like, some, some double L's. Like, that shit just sounds really, really bad. Yeah. Castellon. See, yeah, way, <laughs> way out, way out of the question. Um, okay, so for those of the listeners who do not know who you are, you know, you and I connected at the Dream Mastermind event in Miami. We were both speakers, and uh, you did an incredible job there. I wanted to bring you on the podcast, but why don't you kind of give everyone a little description about your background? Go, you know, as early on as you can remember, where you grew up, how you grew up, big influences in your life, like how did, how did, how did you become Nat City? All right, we're jumping right in. Okay, so I am from LA, born and raised. I grew up with my parents mostly. I did kind of move around a lot. I lived in the Valley. I lived in Palmdale, Lancaster. I lived in Alaska. I was all over the place, really. Um, I didn't grow up with the most traditional family, I would say. So I went back and forth between my mom's house, my dad's house, which meant that I was constantly relocating schools and jumping in mid mid semesters and getting to know people differently i i feel like um i actually just uh posted something about this I'm moving around a lot right it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to jump into new school years and jumping in like in the middle is even worse because everyone's already kind of have has their front groups has their has their 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 routine right so kind of was awkward jumping into schools every every freaking semester um, which helped me become at city. Um, that's what I, that's what I was going to ask there. So what yeah. were you like, what were you like as a kid? Like, were you always this real, like bubbly outgoing person or, you know, were you shy moving around into schools and had to learn to adapt? Yeah. You know, I remember in the beginning, like, I think it was third grade. It was the first time I moved into a different school mid school year and I loved Backstreet Boys. I was obsessed with them, but the Backstreet Boys were not cool. They were not cool. The NSYNC, NSYNC was like the popular band and I had to like, oh yeah, I love NSYNC. You know, my favorite color was not purple. 
it was purple because everybody loved the color purple. And for me to be able to like hang out with these, these cool girls, I kind of had to mold into what they liked. So that wasn't, obviously that's like, I look back and I'm like, oh, you kind of had to just do that for survival. But then, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, I, I just did not like the same things that other people liked. I didn't want to be a part of one clique. I kind of liked the, the nerdy debate team. I loved the cheerleaders because they were funny. Easy. I was on the debate team. Let's, <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Like, it's not that nerdy. There's some weirdos yeah. and some debate tournaments, but you know, okay. for, for everyone here, I'm correcting that. They were not, they were not nerdy, but definitely, you know, you know what I mean in the sense of like, yeah. the click, clicky stuff, right? I kind of liked everyone. I like them. <laughs> Um, so that being said, I, I, I kind of learned to, you know, stop trying to mold into what everyone else was doing and just be myself because, you know, it, it just didn't matter really what everyone else thought. And right. so I started just coming to, uh, myself, becoming myself and really just owning what what age did you did you make that decision right like I, I'm no like no matter what I'm gonna be true to what I want right because that is something that you know myself personally like I did I and I hid from who I thought I was right because I I was trying to fit like a mold that my parents wanted and that that like Midwest culture really brings you up to live and I didn't start getting you know out of my comforts I mean until after I got sober you know so like at what age was that. Well, I had to, I think I was 13 and I remember that because I was walking around the mall and the mall was like the only cool thing to do. Uh, so walking around the mall with my dad and I, I, I just remember telling him like, I think I want to get a job. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to get a job. I want to work so I can help the family, help family out with money. I think I could do it. All I need to do is have this permit. My dad was totally against it. Uh, so I signed the permit myself. (laughs) <laughs> and I went and I got myself a job at four, I was 14 and um, I just I just got into working and like finding out that I loved to have a schedule and like I, I knew how to sell straighteners and curlers and makeup and I don't even know what the question exactly was but I, I was 13 and then I I don't know I just I went into my own, my own bubble of like I need to work I need to, I need to make money to help my family. I need to make money. I need to do this. I need to do that. I just put school on the back burner and I was like, you know, let me just jump fully into this work thing. I think I can be a great salesperson. So I, yeah, I just, I think 13, 14 was like my, me deciding that everything else was just extra right. stuff. I didn't really okay. and, and then so, you know, so, so you sign this permit, get it, get a job, you're selling curlers and shit like how so so what happened you put school on the back burner like what happened until you were 18 right so what happens what happens next sorry um well I my parents were again but there was back and forth there was a lot of like um dysfunctional things going on in the household um so I looked up the laws about uh, officially becoming uh, an adult and so there's a thing in California where you can emancipate yourself which means that you can prove to a court system that you can financially take care of yourself you no longer need to be seen as a minor and you can pretty much just be independent right right so um, with the help of a substitute teacher who was also sort of a like a mentor not a mentor but uh, a guidance counselor for kids, um, I, I just told him that I wasn't really happy with my living situation and that I needed to I needed to get out. Um, I got myself an apartment at the age of I think I was 15 now, 15 15 going on 16. I got myself a, a little studio apartment that was nine hundred dollars, super freaking expensive for a 16 year old, right? Yep. I went on Craigslist and I needed a car because this bus stuff was just not working for me. I was just never on time to make the bus. So I was always walking and I, I found a car on Craigslist that was $700. It was like Chrysler. It was a, what was it? A Chevy Cavalier. I think it was 93 or 94. Nice. Um, I didn't have a license. I didn't have insurance, but I drove it literally just one block down so I can get to the mall every day. Same route every single day. I didn't do anything crazy. And I, I was just working and working to live really. 
Just right. pay me all the rent. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so, I mean, that's a big decision, right? Like, at that age to emancipate yourself, that's a really big decision. And obviously, you know, you had a number of circumstances going on at, at, at the house that led you to that. But like, you know, were you scared? Like, was that, you know, like what was going on internally at that time? Honestly, I don't feel that fear is the correct word because I didn't see it as, as I just saw it as something that I needed to do. Like it just needed to happen. So no matter how it was going to happen, no matter like what, what outside things came in as it was happening, I just had to take it on. It wasn't, I wasn't so much scared as I was just prepared to, to get it going, to get myself into a place and feel more comfortable live in my living situation. Um, I, 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 I definitely remember that I was scared, not so much about the situation, but the little things like, oh shit, I have to buy toothpaste. You know, right. like you're living on your own now. There, there's a lot of things that when you're with your family and your family's house, home, you have, you know, your everything's accessible. You don't think about like who buys Q-tips, who actually goes. Those are the little things that were fearful to me, like running out of, of milk, running out of toilet paper, running out of like living like necessities and not having money to buy them. That was my fear. The being alone, I, I kind of always... Uh, I was always alone. My dad was always working. My, my mom was never really around at a young age. So I, I was the one that had to take care of my little brother. Uh, my older sister, she moved out when my mom left. She left with my mom. So it was just us three, my dad and my younger brother. Um, and really it was just me and my younger brother because my dad wasn't there. So there wasn't so much of a, the independent thing, the, the being alone, I, I, I just, it was just a part of me growing up. So it gotcha. was Gotcha. Okay. So were you going to school at all? Well, I was. So I was in ninth grade. I was still going to school here and there. But the problem was that once I started making money and being able to support myself, I got so invested in my job. And like, even though it was just a silly sales job at a kiosk in the center of the mall, I just took that as like, that was my environment. That was my life. So going to school, I just felt like, what's, why do I need to go to PE? I'm fit. Right. I'm fine. Why yeah. do I need to learn? Like, I just didn't, I didn't prioritize it. What I prioritized is survival and making money to be able to pay again, everything that I needed to survive. And I, I think it was 10th grade. I decided to enroll myself into a homeschool. So they would just give you these packets and you just have to study a book, answer the questions, tr turn in all your packets. And that's how you would get credits. So I think I got up to like, senior year in two years um, because I was just always doing, I was just turning in these packets, but graduating didn't happen. Never graduated. I, um, I just, it wasn't one of those things that I didn't, I didn't grow up with the, Oh, you need to graduate high school, be a lawyer, be this, be that. No one had that, that idea or that they didn't tell me to do that. My dad wasn't, you know? Yeah. Did they give you, so, Growing up, other than like survival, I mean, obviously, you know, you were, you, you mentioned that you had the thought, like, I want to make money so I can help out, um, you know, help the family out with finances and shit. So survival was just a, a mindset that you had always seen and obviously adopted, you know, via osmosis, just being in it, right? Yeah. No, there was no direction ever really like, this is what happens when you're older, like, you can yeah. do things. Well, the thing is, when, when anybody would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, Right, like, because that's kind of like usually yeah, kids. That's a question. Yeah. That's a question that everyone asks. Um, I would change my mind every single time I was asked. So, what do you want to be when you grow up? I kind of want to drive. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a marine biologist. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a therapist. I always change the answers. I want to. I think at one point I was so obsessed with like crime investigation that I was like, I want to be a. I want to be a a detective. Um, and then finally, I, I think this was around 17. Um, my dad and I were, when I moved out, my dad and I were still kind of, we were so cool. We didn't really see each other that often. He, I think yeah. he was not the fact that I left and I, you know, but I told him that I wanted to be an actress because I can be everything I've ever wanted to be as an actress. And he was like, yeah. yeah, he was like, yeah, well, you definitely have the personality to do it. So you should do it. And, uh, I never did because I was scared. <laughs> Not well, 
later on. Uh, uh, not happen, right? Okay, yeah. so you know, you're working at the kiosk in the mall, right? Now it seems like for everyone listening, it's like, okay, that's a big jump, right? Doesn't graduate high school, is working at the kiosk in the mall. Now she's on the Wake Up Wealthy podcast, has you know got this massive brand. Like, the fuck happened? Okay, so I you know, let me fast forward a bit. I'm going to go into like a quick, like, okay. I went through so many jobs. I went through so many jobs. I went, I was an optometrist assistant. I was a waitress. I did bottle service in Hollywood. I, I worked at Hooters at one point. Tips were great. I, I did everything. I was just always hustling. I was constantly moving, doing so many different things. And when social media came around, I remember Vine was the first platform that I jumped up, jumped on. Um, Again, adapting to this, like, I don't really care what people think of me mode. Yeah. I would make these, like, quick videos on Vine that were really funny. Uh, just making a fool of myself, really. Or just saying completely out of line things. Or, or giving my opinion on things that a lot of people didn't agree with, but some did that found, found it funny. I started to get a lot of followers and, and a lot of, like, uh, comments. A lot of random people just, like, jumping on and saying, who's this chick? This is funny. And Vine had the revine feature where you just keep revining them. A couple yeah. of my videos were, were essentially viral on Vine. And then I started meeting others that were, now the term is influencers, right? right. Then there was no term for it. It was just, oh, you have a lot of, you have a lot of revines. Oh, you have a lot of followers. Cool. Why don't we collaborate on a stupid video? So I worked with Cody Johns. I worked with a lot of these influencers that were on Vine at the time. And um, uh, that, that kind of just showed me that there was a platform where you can get a lot, uh, get an audience. Yeah. Uh, that soon died. <laughs> and I jumped on Instagram. And well, that's, so, that's so crazy to me. So let's talk about that for a minute. So like Vine is really like, so, okay. So I've been on, like I had a Facebook or whatever, um, but I, I didn't have an Instagram until a little under 18 months ago. Like I've done everything that I've done on Instagram in the last 18 months. And I have no idea what the landscape looked like before. And, but like looking at some of the history of social media, like really figuring out when things popped, right? Like Vine created influencers straight up. There was a tight knit group of people on there making good videos. And it's crazy to me that that, plat like that created, I mean, an entire economy and that platform's dead. It's gone. It, it was so sad because I mean, I think there, I think actually me seeing that I, I actually fell in love with Instagram before when you weren't even able to upload photos, you right. know, you weren't able to do video, you weren't able, there was no stories, there was nothing. It was just, you have to take a photo directly from the, and upload it there. And there was like 10 filters or five filters that you could use. Valencia was like the popular one. Oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't know that you couldn't upload. That's nuts. Yeah. You couldn't upload. You had to take wow. it directly. Yeah. Right. So it was like. I mean, now we have so many apps that we can use to edit, to cut, to color, to play with, and then we can upload what is perfection, right? Before, yep. it was just like, boom, snap, put it up, you're good, whatever. Um, anyway, so that being said, I, I fell in love with this social media stuff, and, and I uh, switched over to Instagram. I never was a YouTube person. Um, never was. I do have a Facebook, or did have a Facebook, but it was more so just for family, just yeah. uh, you know what was a MySpace, my top eight followed me to Facebook. Boom, stayed on Facebook. Goodbye MySpace, and then moved on. Right. So Instagram, um, I was simultaneously going on auditions. I joined an acting class because I decided why not? Let me jump in. Um, <coughs> started auditioning, booked a couple roles, and because I booked those roles, I got a lot of followers on Instagram. My Instagram started blowing up. Not only did I blowing up at that time when 10k was like wow how do you have 10k right just yeah. having a by the number was a big deal so uh yeah these uh abc family shows i was on uh chasing life which was the first of uh, what the first guest star that i had that one they had a huge twi uh, twitter i didn't mm -hmm. really have twitter and uh they posted me on that and and you know how that works yeah. right so all of a sudden you start to grow a little bit of a, more of a following um and I received emails from brands, like at the time, I believe it was like skinny tea or uh, there's just a lot of different teas, a lot of like, <laughs> yeah, just a lot of teas, man. It was just, just a ton of emails of like, Hey, we would love to send you some product in exchange for a post. Cool. You know, little did I know uh, till later that, wow, there's actually money here. So yeah. 
Um, a lot of a lot of emails. I started responding to them as uh, my own agent. <laughs> I was so, and then I, I want to ask because obviously, like brand deals, it's a thing that people talk about now. Like most people, like come in so and they want to really take the route that I guess you have taken, which isn't that realistic anymore, right? That was a different time on Instagram. Like you can't just hop on, post some photos of the Valencia filter, and then ha get brand emails, right? Like it's a different ball game. It's a different ball game. But so these emails were just showing up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think whoever, um, I mean, obviously before influencer marketing or social media marketing was really even a thing, it was just like, hmm, what if we just have her take a picture? Like PR was on top of it, right? Just emailing these girls that had a lot of followers. Yeah. I, I didn't even know there was value. I didn't know anything about it. I was just like, yeah, sure. I would love a, a, some clothes for free. Yeah, I would well, love you, you weren't a business person at that time. You didn't know about it. No. analytics and shit. Yeah, I didn't know any of it. But I was like, yeah, whatever. Then once I started to see that a company offered to pay me, I think it was like $50 to just post it. I'm like, huh. There is a, there's something here. I just don't know how to turn it into a business or, or what do I do about this, right? Uh, so I promised myself, you know what? The next email that you get, the very next email you get, instead of saying, yeah, I'm gonna do it for free. No, say, this is my rate. Come up, come up with a really awesome package or, or something like that would make it so much cooler than just one post and just pitch, pitch the shit out of it. Sure enough, the next email was a, an app called Brandstop. Brand snob. And the platform was a influencer and brand connector. So essentially a Tinder for brands. Yeah. And, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, uh, I would love to work with you guys. Uh, my rate is $1,000 a month. I will post four, uh, four photos, one a week. And then the last, the final week, I will also throw in a 15 second video. Right? And I'll create all the content for you. Yeah. I didn't think at all that I was going to get a response. A thousand dollars to pay this chick who has like 20,000 followers. Yeah, right. They responded, we love the idea. Let's jump on a call. Now I'm like, oh shit, let's do it. Right? So nice. jump on a call and yeah, six, six, seven months later, I am now running their social media. I'm now connecting all influencers in LA to the app. I was working like for them for three with them in a sense for three years. And that's how I jumped into my business influence. Right. Um, okay. Okay. So t tell me this, like now, how has the landscape changed? Cause obviously, you know, I, I see you still, you still do brand deals, right? Like there's people who are listening to this who want brand deals. Yeah. How did they, how did they get that? Okay. Well, I would say like, well, obviously you got to target whatever your brand is. So I mean, totally fitness, fitness, then maybe you can go on to, uh, whatever, whatever brands you like Nike, obviously that's, that's far out there. Cause they're really, you know, their influencer programs are pretty, pretty tight and they go mostly right. celebrity. But, but what, what, are, what are brands looking for from like an analytics standpoint, right? Like what kind of, like, what can they actually, what do you have to be able to provide in order to get paid? Insights, the numbers, how many people are engaging with you? What are the impressions of your posts? Who's looking at it? What are your demographics? Are you mostly followed by women, by men? They want to see, they want to see your content, that your content's on point. They don't want you to just high, like upload low quality content promoting their brand. They, I mean, everything, honestly, I feel like it comes back down to the numbers because brands, yeah. whenever I talk to a brand, they want, they want ROI. They want money. How are you right. going to make money? Do they measure conversions like coming from your links? Yeah. So what I've developed, um, for my business with influence is anytime I run an influencer marketing campaign, like for example, I just did one for a club in Las Vegas, Apex social club. Um, I invited 25 influencers out and I had them do an initial post for the Thursday that the weekend before they were coming over to Vegas and staying there. Um, had them do a post and then I had them screenshot me the following day, their insights. And then I showed the client, added up all the impressions, added up all the comments, showed them the, the, the engagement, screenshotted all the comments, put together a pretty little deck for them with all the analytics. And that is what is gold for them. Because the traditional marketing way with like a billboard or with like mostly billboards, because Vegas is really popular for marketing on billboards here, but there's no way to track it. There's no way to track it. Unless 
there is that I'm not aware of. I've tried to Google it before. I don't think there absolutely is. There's just this, this a rough number that somebody gives a client says, yeah, this is how many people are going to see it, but there's no way to prove that. And I honestly think that when you're walking or driving or, or on a bus or wherever you are, you're not even looking at a billboard. You're looking down on your phone. So I mean, it's, that, that's dead, right? It's like, so dead. Yeah. So why are you spending $15,000 on a billboard? Why don't you give me that budget and I'll actually show you who's looking at what, and I'm going to show you what we're, ta what we're targeting, who we're targeting. And then it turns into this, wow, we got a million impressions. Boom. They love Boom. it. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's what your company does influence, right? Like you, you yeah. got, what you guys are doing is you guys are reaching out to brands, companies, you know, different, you know, different businesses and saying, Hey, we can run large influencer campaigns for you. Yeah. You go to the inf influencers, cut a deal, right? Round up as much social presence as you can. And then, you know, make the shit happen. Yes. We that's do that. Great. We also create content. We create right? a lot of commercial quality content. Uh, videos, 15 second ads, we create, we just create a ton of really cool content. And instead of using what, um, I still love models and work with a lot of models and model agencies, but yeah. being an influencer is just 20 times more effective and, and just smart. The amount of content women and, and influencers are by themselves just inside of a, a, a shoot. Think about how many times you're on Instagram, you're scrolling or or you're looking at, oh, BTS from this photo shoot with so-and-so. Everyone's yeah. constantly posting. So why not, you know, blow that up with some using an influencer for your, your content? Okay, so this is a conversation I like to have with people in social media. Like, give me your viewpoint on the importance of the quality of content and not necessarily like the actual, like the messaging or anything like that, but the actual, like, how visually like aesthetically pleasing is it, right? Like, do you think that that's so, super important right now or not? I think it's important to have um, good quality. I think that right now there are so many ways to do that. Like your iPhone is so, so sharp, the quality in an iPhone now, you wouldn't even tell if you do it the right way, you wouldn't even tell that it wasn't on Canon or Nikon or whatever other fancy cameras there are. I think that you don't have to focus, like it, it depends on the type of influencer that you are. Also, that's where I'm at. Also, like, agree. Because if you're a fashion blogger, you're obviously not just going to take a selfie and it's going to be crooked or flip or, or low grainy, you know, like you're going to obviously want to invest the proper time to show your viewers, your audience that you have a really amazing outfit, focus on the details, edit it so it's sharp and crisp, you know, but if you're, if you're, you know, a comedian and you're making a funny skit. Sometimes I see like people who have 2 million followers just from being a comedian and making little silly skits on Instagram post a, a, a really silly quick Snapchat video that will go over like 20 million views. And you're like, really? That didn't even look that cute. There was no time spent and it, it killed it. Because for that, so, it's totally just- For, for them, that. totally. So like I've thought about, because I mean, he, here's my problem with social media right now, right? Like, especially in my space, I see so many like young entrepreneurial guys who, you know, they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to build a, a, build a personal brand. like. And they think that that translates to money, right? Like, if you're like, you're not a, a great looking girl, dude, like you're a fucking 18 year old, 18 year old dude who can't, you know, like, you're just not gonna get like brand deals, right? Like that's for, you know, maybe I'm like totally cutting dudes off, but like, I only really see women doing brand deals. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've had a couple campaigns where we use male influencers and that's mostly, mostly, uh, it, it, okay, fitness stuff also, I, I guess I forgot about that when I say that, right? But not entrepreneurs, right? Not guys who are like, I'm an entrepreneur, not fitness yeah. coach, different, right? So, the biggest thing for me is that like now, like I'll see guys who I know don't really have, biz they don't have businesses, right? Like they've maybe hustled a little bit of cash and they're like paying people to take good quality photos, like all this shit, right? And it's just, dude, that's a waste of time and money and you're doing it because you're confused. Like I grew 80,000 followers in some of the hardest times to grow the last, over the last, you know, little over a year. And I did it on shitty looking content. Like my stuff looks like ass. Like I take a video on my phone, I'll send it to a guy to throw a progress bar on and like, it'll, it'll do numbers because now here's the deal. Everybody is so focused on aesthetically pleasing content, right? Visually pleasing content that it's a pattern interrupt. 
That's why a video that a comedian does that's just shot and nothing put into it because you're scrolling through. It's like, oh, great picture of the fucking mountains and some chick and then like a fucking ocean, right? And then it's like, what's this? Like, how is this even on Explore, right? And then of course you're going to look at that shit. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, I mean, focus on what's going to benefit you as a businessman, entrepreneur, what, whatever it is that your category is, whatever you fall in, fall under, don't spend time on things that just really don't matter for you. Like you said, like stop wasting money on having a photographer follow you around and creating content that does absolutely nothing for you. You're spending money for no reason. So yeah, I agree with that. But I mean, there, there's definitely the, the there's value for those that, that need to do that. And then if you don't, like you said, you built yours on just throwing a bar on it and, and filming it with your phone. I mean, it's more so the message that you're bringing that matters, not so much where you are if you're on a mountain with a beautiful view. I mean. Yeah, t true. And I mean, to my, like, I am like, just, I, it, it's to a fault polarizing. You know what I mean? Like, there's people who hate my shit. <laughs> and, and, then, and then there's people, there's people who love it, you know, but like, that was something that was really big for me too. Like, and I mean, you experienced this in, in your personal life at age 13, right? Like the second that I stopped trying to please everyone on social media and started literally just being like, if I don't fucking like that, like I'm going to be like, I don't fucking like that. Yeah. You know, and the second I started, you know, being of that mindset, my growth was just happening a lot faster. Yeah. People were engaging more. Like that's just what people want to see. Nobody gives a fuck about like fake shit. Honestly, I mean, it. The, let me go back to the 13, you know, when I said that I, I grew into the accepting myself and being myself at that age, you know, I, the amount of growth I had at 13 is obviously we're constantly growing and evolving. And every single year, I feel like I've had to remind myself about, hey, stop giving a shit about what other people think of you. Stop. That, let go of that fear of judgment let go of that like caring what someone's gonna think about this and this and that and like you know what i mean like it's yes. just you have to remind yourself because i feel like every i feel like yeah i did think about that and grow at that age but then just i just turned 27 in october and i feel like wow you need to let go of fear you need to stop thinking about this you stop doing that because it's like you're growing you're growing more things start affecting you and then you start to realize again wow you you have you have been you are now what you are perceived to be because of that constant perception of who they think you are that now you feel like you have to be that. Stop it. So, 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 so let's, let's, let's dig into this, right? Let's dig in right now into the direction that you were going with your brand. Like some people, some people may have noticed it. I noticed that it was happening because when we met in Miami, you're like, this is the direction that I want to go with my brand, but you had fear around it. And like I said, shut the fuck up. Like, I just was so it. scared. <laughs> Actually, funny thing, yeah, when we met, you were actually, that whole entire conference was just, just so eye-opening to me, like, and inspiring. Everybody in the room, not even just the speakers and, like, and the, the moderator, or not, not even just the guests, the, or the people on the stage, but the people that were watching and just there that were just so eager to learn. And, like, that inspired me as well, because this world it was so new to me, the conference world, the, the speaking. I have yeah. seen entrepreneurs post their videos, and, I, of course, I watch and I listen, but to be there and take notes and like study these, these lessons that everyone else has already gone through and the people there that are like sponges and want to learn, that was just, it blew my mind. It was a new world that I never, ever, ever, ever even like knew of. And I was just so happy that I was invited. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, you sat me down and you were like, shut the fuck up. Just do it. Just do yeah, it. Yeah. And I'm like, but it's not that simple. And you're like, you know, it is just do it. Um, I switched. Oh, wow. Let's, let's go way back. Um, my Instagram was, my brand was more of like classy, hot girl next door. Like I was on Maxim. I did the hometown hotties thing. I was on FHM, you know, bikinis and, and like never really so much any like crazy stuff. Cause my dad follows me and I always have like a little bit of a, you know, like, well, dad can't see that. So I just realized like, wait a second, what the hell is what is the purpose of that? That is not me that, yeah, okay, cool, throw in a bikini, any hot chick can rock it and, you know, get some likes on a photo, but what is the meaning? What is, what am I fulfilling here, right? Satisfaction of likes, couple more thousand followers, it's not doing shit, right? Yep. So, 
my whole goal in life is always just to inspire people and just kind of help anybody going through a hard time. I've always been a very... Why? Why, why was that the goal? Why? Because I feel like I lacked it in my life as a kid. I didn't okay. really have very many. Great, great answer. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I feel like if I, ha if I had somebody that could talk to me for five hours and help me out or just get, help me get through something, probably wouldn't have learned a lot of the, uh, well, probably wouldn't have gone through so much of the stuff that I did. Again, I'm happy with what I've gone through. It made me who I am. But if I can change somebody's path a little bit by just having a couple conversations or write letters to troubled teens, which I'm currently doing with the letter project, like a lot of little things like that, that's always been my goal. So I have to go in from, okay, now you're this hot chick. How do I transition to, to showing what I really am, who I really am? So slowly I started posting more about like the charities that I volunteer for or the organizations that I would drive to Temecula or to, to TJ through Mexico to go and talk to orphanages and, and like help build a curriculum for these orphanages because there was absolutely nothing that the kids spoke any English. They needed some more English. Like, so all these little things that I would start doing, I would post here and there. And so when, when, when did this happen? Because you had, okay, so if I remember correctly, when you told me your story, you said that you, you had a really big Instagram account that you either got hacked or shut down or some shit. Yeah. So it got deleted. Um, I don't actually, I don't remember exactly. I had, I think, 80,000 at the time mm -hmm. when it was like, I think Instagram was barely allowing you to upload photos. It was that long ago. But 80K at that time. Right. Was so, I, I mean, that was a massive account. That was a massive account. So I had to rebuild, which was tough. I think it was, I think my Instagram actually tells me what day I made it again. When I reached out to Dan Fleischman, I was like, Dan, you have to help me. How do I get it back? And there was no way to get it back. There wasn't even an Instagram support team that I can contact because it was automated emails and it was just like the hardest thing to get. Couple, couple questions there. When was this, number one? And number two, how'd you know Dan? Oh, okay. Well, that's a whole other story. Um, well, hold on. Let me see how I can tie the two. Instagram, that, that date, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. I do have that information on my Instagram because it start, it's now telling you when it you tells you now. Yeah. yeah. So I need to remember. I need to look that up. It was six years ago. I want to say five, six years ago. Five, six. Okay. Um, Dan, I met at a poker tournament. So I also oh. deal poker. One of my very many side hustles, I dealt poker at a lot of different charity events, games, blah, blah, blah. And Dan was the most, just the kindest, nicest person in the room. And I just saw how he treated people, how he carried himself. Pretty sure he won the tournament. I don't know. I was going to say, also a, sure lethal, also a lethal player. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he played one more time. Um, Anyway, we, we kept in contact. I did tell him about my ideas and kind of what I want to do. And he always told me, just do it. And just, you know, yeah. we yeah. came from this. And so I knew that he was in the marketing, social media marketing world too. And how can he help me? So he blasted my account here and there. And I found all the content that I had lost because, you know, at that time, pretty sure I went through like six different cell phones, lost content, lost everything. So I had to, to dig deep to build my account again. And yeah, okay. So let, you know, let me ask you this. Okay. So you start making the change, posting about some of the charities that you were working with, some of the giving back that you were doing. And I mean, clearly you made a pretty big change to that. Like, was it when you lost that account? Because like, there's nothing about your account now that I've seen. that's like, this girl's trying to be on Maxim or was on Maxim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, like you look on Instagram and you just see girls like just posting ass pics and shit. And like, that's yeah. not what, that's not what you do at all. No, 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 never. No, no, no. I don't, I, I, I respect it. Do what you got to do, boo-boo, but that's just not my thing. So. Same, same. Yeah. like I get it, but. Um, yeah. Okay, so you, you started posting that stuff. Now, you're, you're following though, because you're obviously still in the middle of a transition, right? So like, what kind of attention were you getting then? What, like, who was following you and like, what direction are you heading? I feel like on it, I have to be really like, I'm grateful because the following that I have, I've never ever received too many, you know, guys being weird. I get right. people the random Indian who's telling me that they have a million dollars in a bank account, they need help getting them out and through the DMs, and then they comment some really weird stuff. But those are just blocked later on. The, you know yeah. what the, you know what I'm talking about, right? They yeah. just they're just so weird. Are they are they fake accounts? 
I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I get, <laughs> I get blasted with auto comments um, as well. Like, I'll look at some shit and it'll be like, the same dude comes the same thing four days ago, and I'm like, fuck. Like, I don't know what hashtag I engaged with that just fucked me, yeah. but like, I, I, it uh, is. It is what it is. Automation is a big deal on Instagram right now, and I have to say, I have used a ton of automation um, to grow my account. Like, it's been hard to grow in the time that I've growing. Like, you got to be a fucking growth hacker, like right now. It's getting harder. Anyway, yeah. so the, the the followers that I have there, they're great. I mean, I, I mostly I have a lot more women followers now because I have slowly thrown in some makeup stuff, makeup tutorial, tutorials, hair tutorials, uh, where right. I get certain clothing, you know, like I, I target more women these days and the guys that I do have following me and that I follow are mostly like, and like you and Dan and entrepreneurial, yeah. uh, uh, influencers just because that's kind of where, that's kind of where I want to be in that space. So well, you're, uh, you're doing a good job. I mean, you, I, I see you've got some upcoming speaking engagements. We obviously spoke at, at a decent event together. Um, you know, how long have you been playing ball in our realm? At where? In like our world, in the entrepreneurial world. Um, it's just a couple months. I mean, nice. honestly, nice. I, you're doing great then. I just jumped in. I just decided, you know what? I'm not going to be scared because you know, you get, you get so scared. You're around these people who have multi-million dollar companies are like really great. Like they're just, they're really seasoned entrepreneurs. Whereas yeah. I'm like, you know, I have my swimwear, I have my nonprofit, I have my digital marketing company, but you know, I'm not at that level, but you know where I want to be. I want to be at that level. So let me surround myself with these people now and we start to learn and just absorb everything. And I'm on my fourth book. Like re I'm just like on it because it's like, I think it was Dan Fleischman or, or was it Don Dan or somebody, I read a podcast, uh, listened to a podcast the other day and it was, um, they said that 2019 is the year. Like it just, you just got to do it now because you don't know where Instagram is going to go or where social media is going to oh. go. So you got to just jump all in now. And I'm like, yeah, you do. You do. Anyway, so I'm really happy because I have a lot of people who support me. I started another Instagram just to kind of like, separate the two where I'm going to be posting more. I'm hoping to grow that one. I haven't promoted it. It's Nat City Talks. Yep, I'm, I saw it. Mm -hmm, I'm, I'm, push, I'm pushing uh, a lot of influencers that are, or micro influencers or girls that are 8,000 that just don't know what to do. Um, I'm starting to do coaching in a sense, just kind of helping them, connecting them with the right people. Something I was already doing, just helping, but this time just not doing it uh, for free because for there's free. a lot of right. You know what I mean? Um, I would just give advice to so many people and I'm like, you know what? Time is money, honey. Let's, let's do this and let's do it right. And I can tell if you're, if you're actually serious about doing something, if you're willing to pay for that time and you're yeah. actually on it, you know what I mean? You'll, so learn, you'll learn that like the, the pains of like building a coaching business, like you're in for a fun ride, but totally rewarding. So like, okay, in case, you know, there's someone on here who really wants to know more about that. Like, what are you, what are you really coaching these young, you know, are they, are they mostly young women? Are you only coaching young women? Like who's the ideal client and what's the main, uh, you know, curriculum, right? Is it like social media growth, getting brand deals, or is it like personal development? What's going on there? So I've broken it down into like a, uh, the first, the first week of the month, we'll be talking about how to create the right content. Gotcha. Well, well, starting with what kind of brand are you trying to, to be? What are you, what, are, what is your brand, right? Who are, who is your, your audience? Who do you want your audience to be, right? What is the meaning behind your, like just figuring out what they really want and then mm -hmm. cleaning up their Instagram completely to make it pleasing and aesthetically pleasing, right? You know how I know how much you love that, but just, just making it make sense, right? So if you're obviously, if you're a fitness person, you're not, you're not, you don't need to post makeup because that's just confusing everybody, right? If you want to start a little like highlight and put stories there to, to make your page clean and like have categories. And if somebody is interested in this, they can click here. That's, I like organization and I like to, like to speak on that. Uh, what time to post, right? Let's break down your analytics. First of all, a lot of these, a lot of these influencers don't even have their analytics set up because they don't have a business account. So it's just like the baby things in the beginning that a lot of people don't realize that it's huge. It's made. You cannot be an influencer without it, right? The right. business page, the um, how to how to when to post, how to really really study your analytics to try to like beat the algorithm, and collaborations, collaborations with photographers, different influencers. Then we go into um, connecting them with my personal relationships, helping them shoot with the right people. 
introducing them to influencers in the same space, kind of building a community of people that can work together, um, similar to uh, like uh, engagement groups, right? Okay. So yeah. kind of yeah. like, right. And then we go, it's just, we're breaking it down. You gotta, you gotta sign up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, the, you know, that, that's a, uh, that's a good description. We've talked about influence. I want to get into a little bit more about what you have going on right now and like where your true passion is at. And then, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So we've talked about influence. Tell me about Project Paper Bag. All right. Project Paper Bag is my baby. It's my longest relationship. We've been doing it for four years. <laughs> So it's like, it's, it's the best. So what we do is we meet monthly, uh, third Sunday of the month usually, and we gather up a group of volunteers. We meet up in the morning and we prepare, we make sandwiches and we prepare brown paper bags with water, hygiene, um, snacks, and sandwiches. So we have four items. We also add socks, coats, blankets, depending on obviously if it's winter, what they need the most. So we get together for a few hours, and then we all together go to Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles and distribute the bags to all the homeless, the communities there. Um, this started four years ago with my partner, Sandra, and it was, it was crazy how it came to be because uh, it started with 100 sandwiches. We just, living room, friends, bags, stamping the bags, positive messages, and then delivering them and handing them out. And you start to, you just kind of start to think, damn, we're not doing enough. We, we have to make this big. We really have to do something about this. The, the homeless communities are just growing immensely and there's really no help for them. And it makes you sad when you go and you see it because you realize, you know, you're, you're taking a lot of things for granted in your own life. You know, you, you think socks, you think about socks. How many socks do you lose? How many pairs of socks are you just like, eh? you know, they need little things like that and can change their lives. Right? So, Anyway, um, we, we built a huge, like a good following and we started getting like some really good influencers to participate and kind of like have them host and take over the Instagram stories and take over the page. And that helped us grow a little bit. Yep. Uh, every month we get, we make at least minimum thousand sandwiches and care packages. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That's our goal every single month. And like our, on our fourth year, we almost made 4,000 and we didn't even have enough. So that just goes to show you, like, there's just a lot of need there. Yeah, any idea how large the homeless population is in downtown LA? The number is changing so often. Um, the last time, uh, you know, I don't want to quote, don't quote me. It was a lot, 80, uh, I'll, I'll have to give you that information. But if you really sit and, like, study, you research it, you'll be blown away. Blown away of, like, just, I mean, what's more heartbreaking than anything is seeing the kids. You know, there's a lot of like families who, uh, there's this one particular family that I'll talk about really quickly is, uh, she, my family, her husband was deported and they lost everything. So she's living on the streets with her two daughters. She sleeps in different shelters every night. Uh, the kids can't go to school. So she tries to teach them at this park. There's a park in downtown called Gladys Park. So she sits there with her kids and she tries to teach them. And she always asks me, she's like, Natalia, mija, please, can you bring some books? And I'm like, of course. Like, so I, you, it's so crazy that you, you see these families and you think, man, for me personally, that could have been, that could have been me, you know, could have yeah, been, totally. right. And, and the reason why it's so important to me, because I know you're going to ask me that, um, when I did move out, there was a, period of time where I had to sleep in that car that I bought off Craigslist for a while. Uh, and I would sneak into the gym and shower in the gym and do my hair at the kiosk and get ready at the mall and spend the whole day there and sleep in my car. And I was way too prideful to tell my dad and I was way too prideful to ask for help. I never told anybody, but just having gone through that experience, I cannot imagine sleeping on the ground in the cold, in the winter, sleeping in the summer, in on the ground, in, in in on the street, you know, not knowing where my next meal will be. You know, I like to say, I always tell people this, like, I mean, there was a couple of weeks, couple of months actually, where I was eating cup noodles every single day. But that was still food, right? And I knew I had my food. These people, whatever their story is, however they got there, who are we to judge their stories, right? 
they don't know where, when their next meal is going to, going to come and they don't know there, there's no guarantee that they're not going to go hungry. And it's just so, it's just, it's, it's horrible. So, um, that's so why, yeah. Let me, let me ask you this. I, I, I mean, it's a powerful story and a, a powerful thing that you have, you have going there, you know, and I'm curious just for myself, like, what percentage of that population down there do you think either got there from drugs or is currently on, you know, drugs, booze, whatever? Yeah, see, that's, uh, I want to say a large, a large, large percentage. Yeah. Um, very large. And the, and the thing is, it's just so easily accessible on the streets. You know, it, it's, yeah. I don't know where, I could never ever even, if somebody asked me, hey, do you know where I can get some drugs? The, no, I don't. But for whatever reason, it's just so it's just so easily accessible in for homeless for the for that public for that community I mean, here, here's what i'll tell you too like addicts like they know like even now like in a room of people like i could tell you who's like got shit you know what i mean well yeah you could, you, from your history and what you know yeah i mean you just cause, i mean because like I, so i i've been at a point in my life where like i was basically sacrificing my next meal to still get loaded right it was like where am i going to get loaded next at above all, above all things above all else right and if i hadn't been so bad that like my body was shutting down if i hadn't been ending up in the hospital all the time i i would have been i would have been living on the street right and then you know after a certain amount of time like hospital visits and just like being beat to shit like i just i i got up one morning after the hospital and went to uh went to rehab but like so many people whether it be pride or ego or you know, whatever it is, they don't get that opportunity. They don't make it to rehab, you know, and they just, they live out there on the streets and it is a, uh, it's great. Like it, it would be really hard for me to go down there. Yeah. It, I, mm -hmm. I bet it, I, I could see why that it it's, it's hard for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people don't, because we, we obviously don't want to push out the sad stuff. Like we, we want to, it's all about positivity and being able to come and like provide a place for families and kids and volunteers of all sorts come together. We have really loud music, we make it fun, and then we go and we help out, but we want it to be a positive experience. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of people come and, and they're just like, wow, Nat. Well, I was gonna ask that. I mean, like, especially for me, but like, it has to be hard for anyone to go down there. Like, I mean, I've been to LA, I mean, a ton of times, right? And I wouldn't dare like, go down by there I, I i would i i would cry like you know and especially just because of all, all addiction you know like dude I, anything surrounding addiction like you know the movie beautiful boy with steve carell and uh timothy chalamet that just came out well i watched it and it's basically my story with my dad and i mean i was just crying in the first like 10 minutes i could barely i, I mean i barely finished the movie right like that's right motherfuckers i cry a lot at <laughs> so just oh, yeah. shut up <laughs> but, um, you know, anything surrounding that, it's, it's super tough for me, for me, but there is a lot of positivity around it too. Right. right? It, and it, it all comes down to changing the narrative. Yes, exactly. And just what you show. I mean, there's so many people in on Skid, on Skid Row that are just so awesome, you know, and you want to do more for them. Like that family, I want to do so much more, but the thing is I can't because it's, it's not my place. Do you see what I'm saying? If I went yep. ahead and helped everybody that I, I, it just, it would just be too, it'd just be a lot. So I, every time I go, I, I remember that family and I try to find them and sometimes I don't find them and it freaks me, it freaks me out. But that's again, investing a little, if you're just a little too much, it might, it gets to a point where it can, I cry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I still cry when I go sometimes because there's new faces all the time. When I yeah. mean, I, I go every month, so I'm familiar with a lot of the people. I'm familiar with a lot of the tents. I mean, there's some people that I'm like, oh, you're so smart. They take all of our, our goodies, and I don't even get mad at them. They take our goodies, and they, they have literally created these racks of deodorants and waters, and they sell them for a dollar. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, what are you doing here? You're a hustler. Like, get a job. Like, come on, let's do this. Like, I try to be a little, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, that, I'm okay. that, that's interesting. Are, are, they, are they always appreciative, or are some people, like, not? Um, in LA, yes. San Diego, yes. We, I tried to do some giving back in San Francisco. They weren't exactly about it. Yeah. So Brian, yeah. Brian Ferrari and I actually took, uh, tried to take pizzas to a bunch of people after his first event in New York to mm -hmm. people living on the street in New York. And they were like, go fuck yourself with your cold pizza. Like, yeah. I was like, 
damn, dude, like you're literally laying on the ground, like chill. Yeah, no, some people, hey, yeah, yeah I mean, there's been some, there's a lot of danger, <laughs> a lot of rude people. I mean, you're, but that's kind of just anywhere you go, really. Unfortunately, yeah. these, people are, these people are homeless. And um, I want to go back to the, just this, the, the drug thing really quickly. Um, it, 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 what's really sad is I've had to take a person that I love dearly into hospitals uh, because they confided in me and told me that they were addicted to heroin. And um, I did not know how to handle that. Had no idea what to do at all. I was just shocked. My, I was trying to contain my emotion because I wanted to be strong for the person, my brother. Mm -hmm. And um, and I Googled, what do I do? What do I do? Cool. So I found all these clinics and I tried to get him involved, enrolled. And guess what? Nobody would take him. So now seeing a person that your, 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 your loved one, right, going to getting rejected, you're getting rejected to be seen by a hospital. For what reason? Insurance, money, no space, blah, 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 blah. It was so difficult for me to find a place for my brother to be able to go and get clean. I cannot imagine how a homeless person could ever get clean. You know what I'm saying? They can't. They're going to be shut. The door's going to be shut in their face before they could even get to talk to the receptionist or to the, you know, it's just so sad. Um, but it just is what it is. So whatever little bit that you can do to contribute to, to, to bring some positivity, positivity to somebody's life, especially in need, it's worth it. And it's, it's, it goes a long way, I think. So I definitely feel like everyone should volunteer for Project Keeper Bag. And if not, yeah, so if, if someone wants to, you know, if they're in the LA, San Diego, okay, so how often are you doing them in LA? You said you've done them in San Diego. Like, what, what's that dynamic look like? We're more consistent with the LA uh, drops because mm -hmm. uh, we have a partnership with the Boomtown Brewery that we use as the space um, okay. to, to prepare. But in San Diego, we, we have another date coming up. I think that the only way that you'll really know, just stay on follow project paper bag. We put the date on the, um, in the bios every single, every single month. Um, yeah. we're constantly posting on there so you can get more information. If you have any questions, obviously you can reach out to me and if anybody wants to participate, um, it's a lot of fun and it's an eye opener. And I think it's an experience that's definitely worth at least going to one time and experiencing it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And is that, is that your main, like, is project paper bag your main passion project? Like, is there anything else that you're incredibly passionate about that you're working on? Um, I have a couple, well, this, my swimwear is a fun hobby, right? It's kind of an exper experiment for myself. I, I just have these relationships with a lot of influencers and friends that are just awesome and they're posts for me and, and I give them free bikinis and everyone wins, right? So I just wanted to see how I can build that brand. And um, I kind of mentioned to you previously that it, it, we got to 10,000 followers just by simply giving away bikinis to all my friends. So we built the brand, and this year we're coming up with some really cool designs. So that's Naya Swim. Um, I will definitely say that Project Paper Bag is, is a huge, huge part of my life. It's definitely a priority. It's definitely a huge, huge uh, passion project slash everything for me. Uh, Influence is my, my, my moneymaker, my business, my you know, I wake up and work on every single minute of my life. There's no nine to five. It's like the moment I sit down anywhere and I really need to get, you know, it's just, it's my, my business. Um, and then Naya is, is, uh, it's just for fun. And who doesn't love cute bikinis and designing fun stuff, right? And if I make some money there here and there, which I know I will, then that's just, you know, fun savings money. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, I want to um, I want to wrap it up here. We've had an incredible conversation. Like, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of the stuff that you have. I'm going to link, obviously, in the description, your Instagram. So, it, everyone, you can find Natalia on Instagram at Nat City. It's two two T's, yeah, N A T T. Yes. Yeah. Why at Nat City? I'll link it. I'll link Project Paper Bag, Night Swim. I'll make sure that all your socials are on there. And uh, we will we will get that going. So it, if you were to leave like a young female who or male who was really interested in like becoming in, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, keep it female, right? I like that question because I, you know I don't see a lot in our space of you know you see people like 
Sarah Blakely and like really big women that have all done stuff, right? But like, you know, I don't go to events and see a lot, a lot of, you know, young women, female entrepreneurs, right? So if someone is like interested in that, you, you know, like one piece of advice to that person, that young girl who wants it. Just do it. I mean, just jump out there and just jump in. I mean, whatever it is you want to do, you got to get started. That's the first thing I can tell anybody. And it's like, I mean, don't be discouraged. Um, just work at it and stay, stay focused, tunnel vision, that shit. Like if you really want to do it, you can. So just, just start, just start. I don't, I don't know. I have so much to say. I hear one, one sentence. I can't. T tunnel vision, that shit is what we came up with. Yes. Tunnel vision, that shit. <laughs> nice. Nice. I love it. That's definitely, that's definitely going to be the quote, the quote on this episode. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on and let's, uh, yeah.